Good morning. It is Tuesday, December 27th, but we are not actually here live today. We have recorded this intro to one of our favorite episodes for you to watch while we are home spending time with our families. So July 1st was a historic day for our health system and really for the entire region, right? That is so true. That's the day we joined a very small club, becoming an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. And we are one of only 53 in the whole country. And this makes it clear that people in the region don't have to travel to faraway cities to get the best cancer treatment available. I think that's like joy to the world yeah. right there. Absolutely. We also explain why this is not just an honor, but a responsibility. While you're watching this Encore presentation, remember we are back live with you next Wednesday, January 4th, with all new episodes of the Morning Medical Update. Until then, Happy, Happy New, new Year, year, everyone. everyone. Today, effective July 1, just a few days ago, I am pleased to announce the University of Kansas Cancer Center has received National Cancer Institute's comprehensive designation. Congratulations. And with that announcement, the University of Kansas Cancer Center is now one of 53 cancer centers to receive that elite status. This now means millions of dollars are on the way for research and to diagnose and treat cancer. The impact this will have on you and the Midwest coming up now on the Morning Medical Update. And good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Friday here on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. It is Friday, July 8th. We have an impressive panel joining us this morning. Dr. Roy Jensen, Vice Chancellor and Director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Dr. Ronald Chen, Chair of Radiation Oncology. And Jeff Wright, Vice President of Cancer Services. Congratulations, gentlemen. Well, well done you. and so glad to have you the day after that big announcement. So this show, of course, would not be possible without your questions. We know a lot of you have questions and want to know more about what we're talking about here. So please send those in right now and throughout the show on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and email us at the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. Well, it was quite the celebration at Children's Mercy Park in Kansas City, Kansas last night as medical, government, and civic leaders joined about a thousand invited guests to mark this big, big moment here in our area. Speakers told the crowd that cancer patients now have a 25% greater chance of survival when treated at NCI comprehensive cancer centers. We talked with folks who explained what this new gold standard honor means for cancer care now and in the future. NCI designation, uh, particularly comprehensive cancer center designation, demonstrates that a cancer center is comprehensive and offers all of the necessary tools to prevent cancer, diagnose cancer early, treat cancers, and then develop treatments for the future through research efforts. And if you're wondering what impact this has on the Metro's economy, it is estimated that the University of Kansas Cancer Center research contributes $2.5 billion to the regional economy and supports 4,100 quality jobs. Dr. Jensen, I want to start with you. Uh, you know, being comprehensive, it, it, does not, it is not a matter of just sending an application and seeing if you get it and waiting around. Tell us a little bit about the process on how we achieve this. Sure. You know, this, this took a, an enormous coming together from entities all across the region. And uh, we're so uh, happy to um, have our partners, uh, Children's Mercy, uh, Stowers Institute, um, and uh, all the campuses uh, of the University of Kansas and, and the University of Kansas Health System all were vital parts of this effort to make sure that, um, you know, we are at the upper echelon of cancer centers uh, in this nation. How long does that take? How long is the process? Uh, <clears throat> kind of give us an idea of what, what goes into it. Well, um, you know, in some respects, it took us 18 years. Uh -huh. And uh, I would point out that we had a couple of recessions and a global pandemic and a few other things that happened. But, uh, you know, it does, uh, the, the new guidelines are set up now such that once you become a designated cancer center, you have to wait 10 years before you can apply to become comprehensive. Wow. And so, um, they, you know, I think the NCI wants to make sure that uh, centers um, are uh, strong, robust, uh, have a stable um, uh, 
leadership structure and um, are making a difference against this disease and then they'll entertain whether or not you uh, get to comprehensive or not. So a lot of hard work over the last 10 years and, and, and way before that. So we, we said the word 53. We became, with that announcement, the 53rd in the country. Hope put that into perspective when we talk about how many, how many places there are to receive cancer care in our yeah. nation and to be 53rd of this elite group of centers. Well, there's literally several thousand uh, uh, places across the country that deliver uh, cancer care. So. Uh, an NCI designated cancer center is probably represents about one one and a half percent of all uh, you know, cancer treatment facilities across the country. So it it really is a very elite group. So for people like me, I can say it's a big deal. This is just a big it is, deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> a really big deal for those yeah. at home. Uh, okay, so Dr. Chen, I want to talk specifically about how and who this will help and how it benefits folks. Uh, we talk about minority and ethnic groups uh, are more likely to develop cancer or be diagnosed with cancer at a later stage when it's uh, harder and less treatable, as we know. Uh, let's talk about focusing on different groups and how this comprehensive center will help. What will be the impact on that and what, what are your hopes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think getting an NCI comprehensive designation isn't just an honor, but it's also a responsibility. So the KU Cancer Center our responsibility is to take care of patients in this entire region, and we define that as the entire state of Kansas and also counties in western Missouri. And to be able to take care of the entire population in this region as an NCI comprehensive cancer center, we also have to make sure all patient groups have good access to care and have good outcomes. And we know that specifically some minority groups and also patients that live in rural areas have less access to care and less good outcomes with cancer. So part of our responsibility is actually to watch out for those disparities and to do things about it to, to reduce those disparities. For example, part of what we do at the Cancer Center is we uh, actually offer free cancer screening throughout the two states. This is really important because cancer screening is the way to catch cancer early when it's most curable. And we know that the individual patient groups or people who live far away don't have good access to screening. So we partner with communities, we partner with churches, we partner with local groups, and we do cancer screening all the time, every year across the region. So that's one aspect. We also do specific research focused on cancers that may have a disproportionate impact on some patient groups. For example, triple negative breast cancer really uh, uh, affects African-American women more. And so we have specific research on that disease. We have specific research on prostate cancer, which also affects black men more. So we're constantly working to, to see how we can serve the entire region and specifically reduce disparities in our patient population. We have never had a conversation about cancer without talking about the importance of screenings. That is always number one off the top, uh, because we hope to not have to. We hope to not have to see people at this stage in their cancer care. So, Jeff, we've been talking about NCI. Help people know and understand what NCI comprehensive means. What it will mean for people living close to our place. Yeah, thank you. And we're so excited about our NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center designation and really what it means to those that live in the region. I remember going back in 2008 and 2009 and we used to call it the, the donut slide. So it would show this big gap in the region where you had to travel at least 250 miles to go to the closest NCI designated cancer center. And Dr. Jensen, as the leader, said, you know, it's not right for people to have to travel a long distance to receive the best care for cancer treatment. So to have it right here in Kansas City means you don't have to travel a long distance for care. If you think about not just the burden of cancer, of the diagnosis itself, but think about the families and having to travel a long distance for sometimes treatments that'll last for months and sometimes a year and you just can't be away from your family for that long period of time. So I think what it means to those in the region is you don't have to travel a long distance. You can come right here now to the newest comprehensive cancer center. Do you think that, I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Do you think that though keeps people from getting their care when they know that now not only do they have to get the care, now they have to figure out what to do with kids and parents and you know, how to get to and from. Absolutely, and also consider all the expenses now that people have, just traveling, cost of gas, I mean, inflation, that cost for having to travel, but now they can stay right here in Kansas City and receive the latest and greatest in treatments. And we talk about 
the importance of clinical trials and being the best opportunity for patients and care. So again, just so excited about this comprehensive designation, what it means to our patients. All right, that leads me to my next question for Dr. Jensen. So NCI comprehensive status, it's about research. So what does that mean and, and what does it mean to a researcher or a physician considering working here? Sure. Well, it, I think it means that we, uh, we're in an elite club and uh, we're as good as any place uh, in, in the country and that uh, either a, uh, a clinician or a researcher uh, or a physician scientist can have confidence in coming here that uh, there will be the infrastructure support uh, to ensure that they're, they can have the career that they want to have and they can um, you know, function at the absolute highest level both on the clinical side and uh, on, on their re in their research program. So, so Jeff, you've been a, a part of this journey for a long time. I know I see the big smile on your face at any time we talk about our, our cancer center, you know, it brings you big joy and I know this is no exception. So uh, tell us a little bit about how though you've watched patient care evolve through this time. I mean, we talk about the 10 years that I feel like this has always been a go-to place, but now we can really say it's a go-to place. So how has it evolved for patients? Well, even in the last five years, if you think about some of the treatments they have for our patients, and Dr. Chen can speak to uh, radiation therapy and proton, and how excited we were just seven weeks ago to open up our, our proton center. But I think about uh, Dr. McGurk and our blood and marrow transplant program and CAR T cell therapy. We didn't have CAR T even five years ago, and I think about patients now that can have the latest and greatest in treatments because of the opportunity to continue to recruit some of the best and brightest across the country. And I think that will continue to evolve. What we offer today will be different in the next three to five years, but our treatment evolution has been really quite significant. And I do apply a lot of that to recruiting physicians that really want to work at an NCI comprehensive cancer center. I want to jump in with some viewer questions, if we can if we can sneak one in real quick. Chris in Independence has a question. What are some of the cancer treatments and drugs that have been created at the University of Kansas Cancer Center? Well, I, I think a great example is uh, this drug, uh, phosphocyclopyrox, uh, which is currently in clinical trials at, at KU. And um, it is uh, one of the first bladder cancer-specific treatments that have been developed uh, in the last 20 years. And uh, we're very excited about it. It was a uh, collaboration that resulted from a basic scientist, a pharmacologist, and a, a urologist all coming together to um, identify this drug having potential uh, as a bladder cancer treatment and specifically modifying uh, this drug to um, ensure its delivery uh, to the kidneys and the urinary tract. We talked about trials being such an important part of an academic medical center. And Dr. Chen, maybe just jump in about how, how great it is to be able to, to have that as an option for patients and patient care to be able to enter into trials. Absolutely. You know, cancer treatment is always evolving. I mean, we do pretty well now, but uh, we want to continue to get better. And the only way for cancer treatments to get better is through clinical trials. So that means that for many patients, the way to access the latest treatment is through participating in clinical trials. It's also a way to contribute knowledge to advance treatment for future patients. And so one of the very important aspects of being an NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center is to be able to offer basically trials for every patient, every type of cancer that walks through the KU Cancer Center door. And so we really have the ability to offer patients trial. And sometimes that's also for some patients the only hope they have because they've run out of standard options and trials is the, is the best hope for them. And I'll also um, sort of just add that the fact that we continue to develop technology like protons also can, allows us to offer more and more trials for patients. Uh, we weren't able to offer patients trials with proton therapy before, but now that we have a proton uh, program, we can offer additional trials to patients because of that. And we're going to talk more about proton here in just a quick minute, but let's take a moment to check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical mm -hmm. Director of Infection Prevention and Control, joining us with Absolutely. our numbers on this Friday. Mm -hmm. Good morning to you. Yeah, hi. Hi. Looks like uh, our numbers are hopefully going down. Again, the couple day trend, I know we haven't been on since uh, Wednesday, but the couple day trend looks like it's going down. 21 active infections now, two in the ICU, two on the ventilator and eight in that recovery period. So what we have seen uh, across the nation is certainly cases are really hitting a, a, a kind of a stagnant level, somewhat up, somewhat down, depending on what 
three or five day uh, trend you're looking at. Hospitalizations continue to be down, uh, but if you look at the MARC uh, data dashboard for COVID-19, it looks like there's a slight continued uptrend in hospitalizations um, over the, the seven day period. So hopefully overall, we will start to now see in our region more of a downtrend of the hospitalizations because I think that is more of a, a benchmark of really uh, how things are going. But we do know that that virus is circulating in quite a high, uh, high amount and predominance around, around our community. Doc Hawk, uh, there's a few headlines swirling mm. around and I just want you to address them mm. if you can. BA5, yeah. now dominant U.S. variant. So they're saying that this may pose the biz biggest threat to the immune protection so far. So what do you know about that? Yeah. What can you tell us? Yeah, I think that, that's a headline. Mm -hmm. I think when, when, when you're talking about uh, most of the media stories and they talk about immune protection, really they're focusing on antibodies. I think mm -hmm. we need to continue to move away from that. Really look at our immune protection against hospitalization, severe disease, and death. And that is not so much antibodies as it is going to be the T cells uh, that will help protect us from severe disease. We know that these vaccines continue to work and create a, a robust immune response through those T cells. Again, we know that through this wave compared to previous waves that there has been you know, lower hospitalization rates, lower death rates, and we still know that if you are unvaccinated, you are five times more likely to die than those people who are vaccinated. So we still continue to have very good immunity against that. Maybe the antibody immunity, which does help protect against infection itself, is not as great. I wanna bring in our panel to answer um, some questions as well. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Chen, I'm gonna have you take this one. U.S. Mm. cancer patient suffers COVID-19 for 471 days. When you hear things like that or anything uh, where COVID is now causing more problems for cancer patients, uh, what, what concerns you about that? Yes, I mean, so the fact that this patient who had COVID-19 infection for 471 days, the fact that that made news also means that it's, it's very rare. I, 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 so in fact, this I think is the second longest uh, COVID infection on record. And so it's incredibly rare, but looking into the details of this particular patient, this is a patient who has lymphoma that has recurred and has also had uh, uh, um, a transplant. And so very uh, immunocompromised type of patients. And we know that patients who are severely immunocompromised may carry COVID for a longer period of time. But this news of being COVID infected for 471 days does not really relate to most of the cancer patients we know. And most of the cancer patients we treat really are able to have a relatively competent immune system or able to clear COVID pretty quickly, especially if, you're, if, if they have been vaccinated. And so for me, and so here at the Cancer Center, we've really developed very rigorous protocols to look out for cancer patients who may have COVID infection and to protect all of our cancer patients from catching that when they're in the system. So I think that's really important to emphasize to the cancer patients out there. And just really quickly though, how has the conversation changed from you know, two and a half years ago when, when COVID was here, we had no vaccination. Now with cancer patients today, what are those conversations? How have they changed? Any concerns, things uh, getting better? I, I think the vaccination has really been a huge game changer. I think the fact that the majority of, of individuals are vaccinated really means that even if you catch COVID, the course is relatively short and the symptoms are mild. And I think that's really important, not only for the individuals, but also for everybody around them. And here at the cancer center, when we treat cancer patients, I mean, two and a half years ago, we were really, 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 really cautious and canceled a lot of treatment because we didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. But now we have very rigorous protocols to protect all patients from catching COVID in our system. And so we're able to continue cancer treatment, which, which they need, so. Dr. Jensen, a newly published study shows a metastatic prostate cancer drug cuts risk of death for hospitalization for high risk COVID-19 patients. Uh, help us understand what that means. So uh, I think this uh, points up the value of so-called big data. Okay. Um, you know, there are thousands of approved drugs out there and we can't test every single one of them in an individual trial to uh, determine whether or not it helps against COVID. But what we can do is look at the medical records of thousands of patients and see whether or not those who happen to be taking a certain drug turn out to be doing better. And then that gives us an indication that that may be a drug we wanna look at and do a clinical trial to determine definitively if it does uh, positively impact the outcome uh, in these patients. And uh, you know, that type of drug repurposing is something which uh, you know, we're uh, very well known for uh, at KU Cancer Center. In fact, 
Uh, Scott Weir, our Associate Director for Translation Research, has won national awards uh, for his efforts in this regard. Dr. Hawkinson, back to you, wrap us up. U.S. pharmacists received permission from the FDA to prescribe mm -hmm. Pfizer COVID pills. What's mm -hmm. that about? Yeah, you know, I think that's good. I think this is part of that um, <coughs> really test and treat. And I think it's really, uh, you know, f continues to emphasize the fact that if you have symptoms, get tested early and get treatment early. And at that point in time, you're reducing your risk of all those other complications. So I think this is one more step uh, to make access more readily available to, to everybody. Uh, we know that pharmacies are, are vast and we know that they're on many corners uh, in, in our cities and in our communities. And I think this is one more thing to, to help try to provide access to these very important drugs to help protect against the complications from disease. So I, I think it's a good thing. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, if you are just joining us this morning, we are beyond excited to talk about the University of Kansas Cancer Center becoming a National Kansas a Cancer Institute Comprehensive Cancer Center. So joining us to talk more about that is Dr. Roy Jensen. He is the Vice Chancellor and Director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center. We've also got Dr. Ron Chen. He is the Chair of Radiation Oncology and Jeff Wright. He is the Vice President of Cancer Services. So this is, question is really to all, all three of you. Uh, the University of Kansas Cancer Center has the only proton therapy center uh, in our region. Do Dr. Chen, you were just talking about this, but what part does proton play in gaining this comprehensive status? I'll start. Sure. So I, I think, uh, I think being a NCI comprehensive cancer center means that we do the latest research. It also means that I think that translates to better care for patients in this region. The impact of the Proton program on the NCI status means that we're able to offer more clinical trials uh, to patients. And very specifically, uh, the KU Cancer Center has joined a national group called the Proton Collaborative. And what that group is, is a national group of proton centers that specifically design and run trials to push proton th therapy to be even better in the future. And so being a part of that group means that we can uh, offer patients these national trials related to proton therapy for many different kinds of cancer. I think that's really important for our patients. I would also say that our physicians and our faculty actually have leadership roles in the proton collaborative group, which means that we are designing these national trials and hoping, helping to push that further uh, for patients in the future. So Dr. Jensen, do they, do they take Proton into consideration? Is that how that works when they're looking at our overall options for patients and what we do so, here? So I think uh, what having Proton therapy reflects is the depth and breadth of our uh, clinical and, and research program. And that's actually one of the criteria is uh, the depth and breadth of your overall uh, program. And so. Uh, this is, uh, you know, proton therapy is certainly an important new tool. It's, it's one of the most exciting things happening right now in, in radiation oncology. And, and, and radiation oncology uh, for many decades has proven to be, you know, one of our most reliable uh, tools that we have to uh, cure and treat cancer. And I think uh, protons takes it to the next level uh, in terms of uh, being able to not only affect uh, many of those cures, but potentially um, uh, be able to minimize uh, the side effects. I want to keep that video up there. That is Lisa Webb. She rang the bell. She was our first patient to ring the bell. Um, Jeff, I've talked to you throughout this whole process from when we broke ground up until this bell ringing moment. What's it? What does this mean? What does this say to people about, we have this announcement yesterday and now we see this. Well, I remember about five years ago when we made a trip to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to Florida, and we saw another proton center. I remember very specifically, I was here with Bob Page and Tammy Peterman, and at that center, we saw, I believe, about a four or five-year-old uh, small girl, pediatric patient that was getting ready to go in for proton therapy. And, you know, it doesn't take much to recognize the significance of having proton here in Kansas City and the University of Kansas Health System and Cancer Center, it really is about clinical trials, but it's really about doing what's best for our patients. So we left that day saying, <clears throat> excuse me, we really need 
proton therapy here in Kansas City. So it's about the patients and about best patient care. I'm so glad we're talking about this because I have to tell you, I mean, you guys use these big words. You, you mentioned a drug earlier. I'm so glad I didn't have to pronounce it. And it's hard for people like myself and the community to understand really what is Proton, what is NCI, why does it matter to me or my family? So I'm really glad that we're, we're talking about it and hopefully educating um, folks. So send us in questions if you have any questions about what we're talking about today. Dr. Chen, we, we know that Proton Therapy benefits patients and then those patients will in turn help um, further research. Help explain that. Yeah, I, I think so Proton Therapy, as has been said, is a advanced form of radiation treatment. Uh, and the technology is very advanced, and the important thing for patients is that it can cure a lot of cancers, but also try to minimize impact on side effects and impact on organs next to the tumor. Uh, and I think part of our mission here, and, and I will also say that proton therapy is a standard of care and it's not experimental. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we want to continue to advance the knowledge, and therefore, our goal is for patients who receive proton therapy here at the KU Cancer Center, we want them and we hope that they will agree to contribute knowledge to future patients. And so we will we'll hope that they will be able to enroll in clinical trials and, and help us understand how many patients are cured, what their side effects look like, what their quality of life is, so then we can use that data to help advance the treatment even in the future. Dr. Jensen, so tell us how Children's Mercy and Stowers Institute for Medical Research contributed to uh, NCI Comprehensive. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one of the things that we have to focus on as a cancer center is, is making sure that we're treating patients across the entire lifespan. And, and Children's Mercy is a nationally known uh, pediatric uh, oncology uh, care center, and, um, you know, they treat the majority of, of pediatric uh, cancer patients uh, here and throughout our region. And so it was uh, really critical uh, that we bring them on board to be able to, you know, satisfy that specific aspect. And, and the other thing that um, has been great about our relationship is I think we've had a tremendous impact upon um, uh, the academic program over at Children's Mercy. They've uh, brought on uh, truly one of the most outstanding cancer researchers that this, uh, you know, that we've known in the last 50 years, a guy by the name of Tom Curran, um, who, um, you know, is, was one of the pioneers uh, for oncogene research. And uh, we're working with them to build um, a, a research program that really focuses on um, these very tough pediatric uh, cancer cases uh, that um, we desperately need to make progress on. And, yeah. and in terms of the Stowers Institute, um, you know, they were established uh, almost 20 years ago to be um, one of the best basic science research centers uh, in the entire world. And uh, we're really blessed to be able to leverage mm -hmm. that expertise. They, uh, those, uh, they are almost required to republish in some of the best scientific journals. And uh, one of the great things about our relationship is that um, we work with them to translate a lot of their uh, cutting edge findings into new therapeutic uh, approaches. And we have a number of projects, um, and specifically a guy, uh, an investigator over there by the name of Lin Hing Lee, uh, that we're working with to try and um, uh, understand how we can take one of those discoveries and, uh, as, and use it as a new treatment for leukemia. Jeff, this has taken a community effort. Uh, as well. Tell us about that. You know, it certainly has, and I, I think about the critical role of Masana Cancer Alliance and hospitals throughout the region. I think about <coughs> North Kansas City Hospital, Olathe, and many, many other partners as part of the MCA, and just the significant role that they play on our NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center designation. I know that the MCA, a very early contributor and significant in terms of contributions to our NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center designation, but it's also been one of the joys as well to make sure that uh, not just here, but our uh, relationship with North Kansas City, Olathe, and many others are able to participate in this comprehensive designation. So MCA has played a really critical role in this designation process. And we thank all of those partners, our clinical partners, our community partners. Um, I have a last question. Dr. Chen, I want to ask you because I have not talked to a cancer doctor who hasn't said either we have been the second opinion or we send somebody for a second opinion. So why would someone want to come to an NCI comprehensive place for their second opinion? Why does that matter? I, I, I think 
um, that I mean, cancer is a very serious disease. It's often life-threatening. And for such a serious diagnosis, it's good, it's important to get the diagnosis right and it's good to get the treatment right. Uh, so when a patient sees me, I often recommend a second opinion. And when a patient sees someone else, the importance of a second opinion is to make sure that your doctors agree on what your diagnosis is and what the right treatment is to maximize your chance for a good outcome. I would say that oftentimes, uh, the first doctor a patient sees may not have all the treatment options available. For example, proton therapy, for example, brachytherapy, for example, CAR T cell therapy. And sometimes uh, if the doctor or the hospital is not able to offer the treatment, you may not hear about it from a first opinion. So having a second opinion to hear about all the options and what the best treatment is for you to maximize your cure and other outcomes, I think that's really important for a cancer patient. And what a gigantic peace of mind for a patient to say you're in the right place or where you, if we're a second opinion that you, you were in the right place to begin with. So right. it's, it's good to everybody working together for the patient. I want to get to some community questions that are coming in. And um, Dr. Jensen, I'll ask you, do we have any new drugs against pancreatic cancer? You know, uh, pancreatic cancer is obviously one of the most difficult cancers that we treat uh, these days. Why and, is that? Well, there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, uh, probably one of the most important is the fact that it often presents as uh, widely metastatic um, on its first um, knowledge that we have it. And, um, and it's very tough to treat uh, once it's extended beyond the, the pancreas. One of um, a, a trial that we're just about to open up uh, right now takes advantage of a very specific mutation that is often found uh, in pancreatic cancer uh, in, in a gene called RAS. And um, nearly all pancreatic cancers have uh, a so-called RAS mutation. And we're finding that um, we can target specific mutations with specific drugs. And um, we're beginning to see some success uh, th um, by uh, doing that. And so we're, we're excited to uh, begin to bring some of these trials on board. Uh, that YouTube viewer is watching us from Taiwan this morning, so we appreciate you tuning in, and we hope we answered that question for you. Question from Mary. What does the new designation mean for the health system St. Francis campus in Topeka? Are there particular services available there that might be different? What does it say about our other locations? Uh, I'll take that. Uh, so San Francis uh, is a very important partner of the KU Health System. Uh, and, and I think that the NCI comprehensive designation in our partnership means multiple things for patients in Topeka, San Francis. For example, uh, the patients at San Francis have access to a lot of clinical trials at KU through the Masonic Cancer Alliance, and they're a major member of the MCA. And so they have access to trials, which I think is really important for patients. The other aspect is that some of our physicians here from KU actually go to San Francis to see and treat patients. I myself, for example, uh, I go to San Francis to, to see and treat prostate cancer patients over there. And we help also not only in person, but we also help with their development of the entire cancer program, uh, development of the technology. So really, I think San Francis being part of the KU Cancer Center has a lot of benefits of translating the KU and NCI designation to the benefit of patients in Topeka and actually also the surrounding region of Topeka, West Topeka for, as, for, as well. People just want to know if they have access to you if they live in Topeka. And it Absolutely. sounds like they do, and that's, that's really good news. Carrie wants to know, and we talked about Proton for children, and Dr. Jensen, you mentioned that Children's Mercy hand, handles the majority of cancer patients uh, that, and children, but um, what cancers would we? Why would a parent want to come here to treat their, their child or get a second opinion from us versus going to like a specific children's cancer hospital? Well, uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start off on that. Um, it was, uh, and, and then have Ron um, uh, uh, back clean up. You know, it's, um, uh, it, it was very important for us to make sure that uh, we had a strong relationship with Children's Mercy before we decided to move forward with Proton. And that's because um, many of the uh, clear indications for treatment uh, with proton therapy are in childhood cancer. So, you know, it simply would not make sense from, from any standpoint to uh, develop a proton center and not make sure that uh, we had that relationship 
uh, and and we can assure access uh, to those uh, patients. And I don't, I don't know, Dr. Chen, if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah, I'll just also say that I think uh, if a child with cancer is seen by a cancer specialist at Children's Mercy, and if that child needs proton therapy or any form of radiation, our relationship with Children's Mercy means that that child will get proton therapy here at KU. We have such a close relationship between KU and Children's Mercy that the care is really well, very well integrated. So in fact, many of the patients we're treating right now with proton therapy are uh, pediatric patients that initially started at Children's Mercy. So we have a very close relationship there. Again, another huge peace of mind for a parent going through such a horrific time knowing that they've got both teams on their side and working for their kids. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, COVID questions, Dr. Hawkinson, so yeah. I'm gonna just jump over to you for a quick moment before we wrap up. One question is, let me see what she asked here. So Angela says, I keep hearing about people I know who are getting COVID in these past few days. Paxlovid mm -hmm. is the go-to treatment, but what treatments are available for people who have kidney and liver problems and should not take Paxlovid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so f uh, so for right now, for outpatient therapy, the preferred therapy is Paxlovid, as you said. The second line therapies would be the monoclonal antibodies or uh, molnupiravir for outpatient therapies. Remdesivir is an IV drug that we use in the hospital quite frequently. Uh, that is available for outpatient as well, but that is a three-day course that you have to go get IV uh, infusion, and so that those systems are a little bit more difficult. But the second-line therapies would be the monoclonal antibody and molnupiravir. And uh, Deb has a question. Good morning, Deb. How reliable are the rapid at-home tests if you do them yeah. in a series? Mm -hmm. As one test, then 24 to 36 hours later, do the second yeah. one. Uh, help people understand what's the best way to do if they're trying to track down those tests. Yeah, we have more information about those home antigen tests. So there was a recent JAMA uh, article, I think it was JAMA or Internal Medicine or JAMA Open Network, but basically they looked at people who were testing themselves at home, but also compared it to PCRs that they were getting. And what they found that there was a peak sensitivity, so the ability to identify that virus um, at about four days after symptom onset. And that was only about 77% of the time. So you probably are better off retesting uh, 24 to 48 hours later, especially if you're having symptoms. But also if you can try to get in to do a PCR test, that will be much more helpful as well. So yeah, that was a good question. Uh, I think it is more reliable uh, if you do get a negative test, if you know you've been exposed or if you're experiencing uh, symptoms to probably test at 24, 48 hours later um, and maybe even up to three, uh, three or four times. But if you can get a PCR test, that is probably best. All right, I'm gonna yeah. turn and get some final thoughts from our guests today. And Dr. Jensen, um, I'd like to start with you. All right. Well, I just want to thank um, everybody uh, across the Cancer Center uh, for all of their hard work on uh, getting us to comprehensive uh, status. And it really is an honor and, and a privilege uh, to be able to serve uh, our patients. And, um, you know, we're delighted uh, that we've gotten to this level. And, um, you know, we think it's going to make a huge difference uh, for people throughout this region. Most certainly. Dr. Chen, final thoughts from you. I, I just want to say, I think the fact that we have an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center in the Kansas City region, this can, the, the significance of this cannot be overstated. We have a world-class cancer center here. We have world-class experts that other people refer to. We have world-class experts that write the national guidelines that, that cancer doctors in the country follow. We do research that other places don't do. This is really important for this community, and I think it's really important that we have the support, and also it's important for our patients. There's really, you don't have to go anywhere else. We have a world-class cancer center right here. Why go anywhere else? That's been the tagline. Jeff, your final thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would say, I heard from Dr. Jensen yesterday talk about how NCI comprehensive designation is an important component, but it's not the end game. Mm -hmm. It's not the final goal. And I also heard from Senator Moran talk about this really brings us hope and for patients to be able to come here uh, for their care and for their treatment. So I'm excited about the NCI comprehensive designation, but excited about what the future brings as well. well. Again, another huge congratulation, guys. Thank you so much for all you do every day and will continue to do. Appreciate you. Dr. Ha and I'm coming yeah. back to you for something real quick, so don't go anywhere. Dr. Hawkinson, final thoughts as we head into the weekend. Yeah, I mean, I think this is great news. Uh, such great leadership uh, here at the Cancer Center. It's always good working with all the 
the physicians and, and the medical teams uh, with collaborations on these complex patients really to continue to Im improve their, their quality of life and, and get them and keep them healthy and out of the hospital. As we get into the weekend, please, everybody wear your sunscreen. Uh, if you're not up to date on your vaccination, please go get vaccinated and uh, you know be healthy and have a safe weekend. Great tips and thanks everyone for being with us today. Great questions, we appreciate you sending those in. You can catch our shows anytime by logging back onto Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. So before we go today, Dr. Jensen, um, I know a lot of people have been congratulating you and, and your teams uh, throughout the community. And there was a guy that came by the other day. Help me, help me, Bill, Bill, Bill. Uh, yeah, I think it was uh, self. Something I like believe. that, like a Bill yeah. self something. Okay, so how did that go? You know, I think it went um, uh, pretty well, and um, you know, I, I I never heard of the guy before. Right. But it was uh, nice that you allowed he, him to come in. He he uh, he got us caught up on a few things. Okay. You know, we've been a little busy around here, and um, uh, he he was just a, a great guy, and uh, I guess he'd heard from the chancellor that we. Uh, accomplished some things and he wanted to come by and offer his personal congratulations. Pretty so, darn nice. All yeah, right. Well, we want everyone to have a great weekend and we'll just, uh, here's a little bit more with Dr. Jensen and Bill Self. Can I help you? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I'm looking for the head of the cancer center. Uh, I think his name is Dr. J. Well, I'm Dr. J, but, but who are you? Uh, who am I? Uh, well, I am Bill Self. I, I'm basketball coach at the University of Kansas, and I'm here to congratulate KU Cancer Center on becoming an NCI designated comprehensive center. Security, last time I checked, the basketball coach at KU was Roy Williams. <laughs> well, buddy, uh, uh, I know you've been working awfully hard for a, obviously a long, long time, but you need to get out a little bit more. Uh, I've been the coach at KU for almost 20 years. Whoa! Sounds like I missed a lot, but in my defense, it was nearly a 2,000 page application and somebody had to write it. I guess all work and no play makes Dr. J a very dull boy. Maybe I can get caught up on this YouTube thing I keep hearing about. I got a better idea. Why don't you just come to our home opener and watch us drop our sixth national championship banner. You can even sit right behind the bench. Whoa, you guys won the national championship this year? That is awesome. Congratulations. This has really been a banner year for the University of Kansas. A banner year indeed. And congratulations again. I understand that makes you one of 53 NCI designated comprehensive centers, right? Yes, it does. Thanks, coach. And thank you for your support. We are on a journey to conquer all cancers. Help us celebrate this latest achievement while making sure we can continue our work to cure cancer. Please consider making a gift today. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.